Welcome back to Sabbath School. We are at lesson 29. Dreams and interpretations. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for renewing your grace in our lives. And uh, we pray that your presence will be with us as we will try to gain deeper understanding of your word, of your world. And Lord, we pray that uh, you will give us the insight of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Dreams and interpretations. We are in Genesis chapters 40 and 41. Chapter 40 is, the whole chapter is written out as a chiasm, as a structure of uh, parallel ideas. It starts with uh, Joseph being uh, in prison. We remember how he got in prison, right? Because of uh, Potiphar's wife. He was accused by Potiphar's wife. And uh, although Potiphar had a very high regard of him, respected him deeply, he knew the only way for him to keep peace in his house was to throw the slave into prison. Now, once he gets into prison... Verse 21 in chapter 39 says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. No surprise, Joseph starts growing again. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison, Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. So that's how 39 ends. Joseph in prison and everything under him again prospers. Joseph is also a people person. How do we know that? In verse 6, chapter 40, it says that Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. Joseph paid attention to the spirit of the other prisoners. He has authority over them, but he cares about them. He notices that this particular morning, these two prisoners, the chief butler and the chief baker, are sad. Why are you sad? Why do you look so sad today? He asks in verse 7. So this is what we have here in chapter 40. First, the chief butler and the chief baker that offended Pharaoh and are thrown into prison have dreams. Each has his own dream. And this whole chapter ends with Pharaoh dealing with the butler and with the baker in different ways according to the interpretations of the dreams that Joseph provided. And as you can see in this little chiasm here, on one side you have um, the interpretation given by Joseph. On the other side you have the fulfillment of those interpretations. And uh, you have one of these folks the butler telling the dream on this side 
and you have the baker telling his dream on the other side. And there is this idea right here in the middle. And this is what it says. I would like to read verses 14 and 15. But remember me when it will be well with you, says Joseph to whom? To the butler. The baker had not shared his dream yet. Actually, according to the text, it seems that the baker shares his dream only after he hears the interpretation Joseph gives to the butler. The butler has that dream with the grapes that he squeezes into the cup of the king and Joseph tells him after three days the king will take you out and put you back into your dignity. And when the baker hears the interpretation of the dream, he's encouraged, although his dream is totally different. The butler's dream was pretty positive. The baker's is not. But he gains courage and he shares his dream as well and then he gets the interpretation. But here in the middle, we have Joseph speaking to the butler, please remember me when it is well with you and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews and also I have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon. How do you see Joseph in this context? His request. How is he? Desperate. I'm not sure he's desperate, but he, he's human for sure. Because he has experienced God's hand in his life up to this point in so many ways. And he knows God is with him. He can see that God again is elevating him and uh, places him into a position of authority and yet he wants out. It's very normal, I suspect, for somebody that is in prison to just want to get out of here. And uh, I don't think he totally relied on uh, the butler, but he sure asks the butler in a pretty human way Hey, please, when you are out there and uh, it's high life for you, remember me and do kindness to me. Get me out of here. Joseph wants out. The butler is placed back into his position, his uh, dignity. He's now the cupbearer of the king, of the pharaoh again. Will he remember Joseph? No. So the story ends, verse 23. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Joseph stays in prison. And uh, he stays there for another two years. We don't know how long passed between the moment he got into prison and this moment when he interprets dreams. What we know toward the end of chapter 41 is that at the time when he becomes second in command, when he becomes the right hand of Pharaoh, he's what age? How old is he at that time? You remember? 30. He's 30. You'll find that in uh, chapter 41. He was taken to Egypt at the age of what? 17. 
So this story with the butler and uh, the baker happens 30 minus 17. What is that? 30 minus 17 is 13, right? Minus 2, so this is 11 years, 11 years that he has spent in Egypt already. So 17 years old when he gets to Egypt, when he's sold. 11 years part of it in the house of Potiphar, part of it in prison, we don't know how long. He has to stay two more years so that at the age of 30, he can get into the service of the Pharaoh. In any case, it's a long time. So that explains why he really wants out of prison. I suspect he stayed a long time in prison. Uh, probably much longer than in the house of Potiphar. Because the way the story in 38 and 39 developed, you get the impression that pretty soon after Joseph was uh, brought to the house of Potiphar as a slave, his wife already started trying to uh, entice him. So he probably spent more time in prison than in the house of Potiphar. He stays two more years, and then something happens to the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh sees some dreams. And chapter 41 describes the story of Pharaoh's dreams in uh, verse 14 of 41. It says the Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And that's the focal point of a little chiasm there. How come Pharaoh got to know about Joseph? The butler. Finally, the butler. And it's very interesting to see how he says it. Verse 9, then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, what does he say? Verse 9 in chapter 41. Remember, that's exactly what uh, Joseph asked for, to remember. And he says, I remember. What does he remember? I remember. What's your translation there? Very, very good word. I remember or I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Because he understands what has happened. And hey, my translation says, I remember my faults this day. But the point is this. It seems that when the king speaks about his dreams and nobody can explain or interpret the dreams, it dawns on the butler, because he's one of the chief servants of the king, it dawns on him, and it's a very complex conglomerate of uh, remembrance that he has. On one hand, he remembers Joseph. He also remembers what he did and why the king had punished him at that time. So he speaks about shortcomings, faults. I remember. But that's exactly what we needed him to do. We needed him to remember. Because what happened is two years passed and he had forgotten. So he finally remembers but how does he remember? The Pharaoh speaks, shares his dream, but who gives the dreams? God is the one that gives Pharaoh the dreams. So then, who does make the butler remember? 
see how God moves something on that uh, chess table so that the one that has to remember would remember. And uh, he says, now there was a young Hebrew man with us there. That was Joseph, of course. And uh, when Pharaoh hears about that guy, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And uh, he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh speaks to him and tells him, I have heard it said of you that you can understand the dream to interpret it. And Joseph answers, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Somebody tell me what the Hebrew word is there. Mm -hmm. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Peace of shalom. And shalom in Hebrew is not only peace in the sense that we speak about peace today or when the crossfire ceases. Shalom in biblical language is also well-being or plenty or plenitude. So Joseph even before hearing the dreams, knows God was going to give the Pharaoh an answer of peace, of well-being, of shalom. There's something interesting here. Doesn't it surprise you that God gives Joseph the gift of interpreting other people's life, tell them, what their dreams mean, and at the same time, he doesn't know what is happening with him. That is pretty odd, isn't it? So, Joseph can interpret the dream of the butler. He can interpret the dream of uh, the baker. Of course, interpretations come from God. It's not in me, he says to the Pharaoh later. He will interpret the dreams of the Pharaoh... He knows God will give him an answer of peace, of well-being. But does he know what is going to happen to his own life? Because when he's in prison still, he asks the butler that he knows was going to be restored into his dignity to remember him and get him out of there. I'm underlining this for a reason. Yes, Joseph is a wonderful character. But let's not explain his humanness away. He is a human being. And for him, freedom, just as for any human being, is a very important good. And he wants to get out of prison. And he knows that God can intervene for him, can get him out, but he also knows God can use people. So he asks the butler to say a good word. Somebody said, anybody can uh, harm you or say something negative about you. Not everybody is able to help you and say something good about you. He's hoping the butler will say something good about him. And God organizes the chain of events in a way that finally this guy, the butler, remembers. So Joseph is there. He listens to the dreams of the king, of Pharaoh. And uh, verse 25 says, Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. And uh, then he explains what it means. Verse 32. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice, he says, because the thing is established by God 
and God will shortly bring it to pass. I would like to emphasize this. It's repeated twice. It's given twice because it's important and it will shortly bring, God will shortly bring it to pass. You probably remember if you attended Revelation seminars that we use this concept of repetitive revelation. For instance, in Daniel chapter 2, you have the kingdoms of this earth. In chapter 7, again, the kingdoms of this earth. Then in chapter 8, there's a repetition of it again. Why? Because when something is important, it is repeated. And that concept appears for the first time, it seems, here in the story of Pharaoh and Joseph. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. According to Joseph, what are those two qualities that a leader should have? What are those two features, two traits? What? He should be discerning and wise. And there's something else in verse 38. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this? A man in whom is the Spirit of God. So that's a third quality. So you have discernment, wisdom, the Spirit of God, says the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh notices in Joseph the Spirit of God. Was the Spirit of God within Joseph or outside of Joseph? How could the Pharaoh see the Spirit of God in Joseph? Do you remember of anybody else about whom the same is said later? Interestingly, it's a pagan queen and also a pagan king that recognizes the same thing in that other character. Who's that? Hmm? Not Elijah. Daniel. Daniel. The mother queen, wife of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and also Darius in chapter 6, notices that an excellent spirit is in Daniel. And the word there is a surpassing spirit. I'm just tying these together because I believe a surpassing spirit was in Joseph as well. And the way I imagine it so that I can grasp the picture is, you know, when there's a surpassing spirit in somebody, the spirit surpasses that person. Therefore, that spirit can be seen on the outside as well. Did you capture that picture? You have a human being, the Spirit of God is within him, but the Spirit is a surpassing Spirit. Therefore, you can see it from the outside as well. And it goes on, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, verse 39, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. And he places Joseph, watch this, there are two elements there. He places Joseph over Egypt, but he also places Joseph over his own house. If you know a little bit about the structure of monarchy, you will probably know that usually a monarch was in charge of that whole uh, country or land, but there was also a special segment of the land called the house of the king. And uh, the house of the king would even have an army that was different from the army of the land. Anybody knows why? So that in case the land rebels against the king, the army of the king's house can 
protect the king. What is interesting here is that Pharaoh places Joseph not only over the land, but also over his own house. Verse 42, Then Pharaoh took his signet of his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. This is again a moment when we deal with jewelry. So uh, those that want to find an argument against or for jewelry will uh, have a very important verse in this passage. Put a gold chain around his neck. And Joseph did not say, no, I don't want that. Let's be honest with the text. That doesn't mean everybody has to have a golden chain at his neck. But just be balanced. Verse 44, Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Then he gives him the daughter, the daughter of a priest, of a pagan priest. Uh huh. So Joseph was married to a pagan woman? Pretty much so. Don't think that the priest of On, On was a city in Egypt, was a priest of the Most High. Most probably it was a priest of uh, the god Ra, the god Sun. Sun as it is on the sky. So we have some challenging things here. And uh, toward the end, there is a moment in verse 55. It says, so when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. Do you remember anybody saying that same thing to anybody? Whatever he says to you, do. Who? Uh-huh, uh -huh, yes. Mary, Jesus' mother, said at the wedding in uh, Cana, whatever he tells you to do, do. And that's what happened. And there in Egypt, from the wife the Pharaoh gave to him, the daughter of uh, the priest of On, Joseph has two sons. The firstborn is Manasseh, and the second is Ephraim. One is forgetting or forgetfulness, and the other one is fruitfulness. But here again, we will have a reversed order later on because Ephraim will take priority to Manasseh when Joseph blesses them like this. Questions? That's a good question. So the question is, do you think that because he was married to a pagan, a pagan lady, that's why he was not the one to continue the lineage of the Messiah? We cannot say yes for several reasons. Tamar, you know Tamar? She most probably was a pagan as well. The one that had that uh, very interesting interaction and then uh, intercourse with Judah, her father-in-law. So that doesn't seem to be the criteria. Another name, another pagan in the same genealogy is Rahab. Rahab the pagan, pagan lady that seems to also be a priestess. 
She was a prostitute. That's what the word is in the Bible. But contextually, and I did a word analysis on that, it seems that the word used there for prostitute was used in the context of a prostitute priest. The goddess of Jericho was the moon. They were moon worshippers. And among other things, the moon goddess had uh, prostitute women, priestesses, that would serve the man. So, a very iffy story there again. And then later on you have Ruth, the Moabite. Ruth wasn't um, a Jew, and she's part of the genealogy as well. So we cannot say that that's a criteria. Is there something related to that? Because in these other cases, we can infer at least that all three of the other ladies that I mentioned, meaning Rahab, Tamar, and Ruth, they are all uh, pagans, but they came and uh, became God worshippers, Yahweh worshippers. Maybe this daughter of the priest of An did not become one, but then how does that exclude Joseph's children? Or does it even exclude them? Because in Esau and Jacob's case, we have two components related to the firstborn status. One was the firstborn right that Jacob bought with a lentil soup. Remember? So that was the firstborn right. And then the blessing of the firstborn, which he took away by putting on the clothes of his brother and those skin things. In the case of Joseph, isn't Joseph the one that gets the blessing of the firstborn? Well, his sons, they are getting the blessing of the firstborn, and Judah gets the firstborn right? It seems to me that that's the case. We'll see that later on. So somehow these two components of the firstborn are divided here by Jacob between the two sons. One is Judah and the other one is Joseph. But I don't know, I don't know if that is indeed a problem. It may be a problem. The text does not highlight it, that that is the problem. I heard a very interesting explanation that said that the problem of Joseph, the mistake Joseph made in chapter 41 is that when he was taken out of prison and was heading to Pharaoh, he shaved his beard. You know the text says that, that he shaved. But the text doesn't say that was a criteria of any kind or any kind of mistake. It's obvious that in prison, it's more difficult for somebody to keep his uh, face clean. It's also visible in the Bible that the Jewish way of appearing in public was wearing a beard, a full beard. But when he goes to Pharaoh, he shaves because the Egyptian way was shaving. Somebody used that uh, once against my beard and said, uh, Pastor, how can you preach with a beard? When Joseph went to the Pharaoh, he shaved his beard. And you preach with a beard? Yeah, so, you know, I'm just giving this as an example of how we can make theology out of something that is just mentioned in passing. And the reason it's mentioned is because it wants to give somebody the impression that when Joseph went to the king,
king, to the pharaoh, he prepared for that moment. He didn't just go straight from the prison. Uh, he shaved his beard and that's how he went. Yeah. Good question. Good question, yeah. Yeah, so here you have a worshiper of Yahweh that becomes the second in command of Egypt. So the question is, why didn't he do evangelism and convert the Pharaoh to Yahweh worship? Well, the first and honest answer, we don't know what his conversations with the Pharaoh were. I can hardly believe that somebody in whom the Pharaoh himself notices the Spirit of God, because that's what the text says. Let me, yes. Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? And then the Pharaoh brings down all his family. And the Pharaoh even meets Jacob, the patriarch. I can hardly believe a pharaoh that is put in that situation has no God conversations with Joseph. I would say there was a pretty strong evangelism going on between Joseph and the pharaoh. Because remember, Joseph was in charge of pharaoh's house as well. Not only the land, pharaoh's house as well. And just like uh, Potiphar noticed that this guy is different, this guy is special, and everything prospers under his hands, the same was seen by Pharaoh, and the whole land practically noticed that something here was different. Now, do we have anything very specific about this? Not really. Because the way the story is presented is to give us a background of the salvation story of how the whole thing evolved, the whole story of Abraham evolved all the way down to the Messiah. So that's the reason why we have the Old Testament stories uh, laid out uh, one after the other, because there's a narrative, a storyline going somewhere. The same question can be asked about Daniel, for instance. Daniel was in pretty much the same position, second in command. Third, in the sense that um, they also had uh, um, a co-regent. But do we have any specific moment when Daniel, out of his own initiative, goes and preaches to those kings? Not really. We have moments when he has to go, when he speaks to the king about God, and the king even recognizes God. What we see later on in the time of Moses is that uh, things become bad for Israel because uh, the pharaoh, the new pharaoh, forgot about Joseph and probably about Joseph's God as well. But I'm pretty sure at the time when uh, that famine happened, the seven uh, years of uh, scarcity, Pharaoh and the whole land knew that it was God's hand, God's spirit that lived in Joseph that made a difference. But evangelistic moments, specific moments are not described indeed. I think there may be a lesson there. Maybe the lesson is that in our specific places where God places us, each one of us, the point is not to go like this into somebody's eyes with your gospel, God, and principles, but it is to be the man, the woman, the person that God uses there, that excels, that shines, that makes a difference, that will be noticeable and noticed because of the Holy Spirit being 
within you. And if that happens, then God creates contexts in which it is not you poking, it is them needing you. It is God using you in that context. That does not have uh, anything against uh, evangelism or being uh, an initiator of a conversation, if that's a possibility. But from what I can see in the Bible, when somebody had an impact, it was the man, it was the woman that was visible, noticeable, and the people started asking questions. Yeah. That's a good observation. At that time, Joseph did not have a Bible. Joseph was the Bible for Pharaoh. If you can uh, visualize that. It was the written letter, as Paul uses it later. The written, you are li written letters that people can read. And Joseph was one of those written letters. There is a moment when uh, Joseph says, God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace, of well-being. And uh, that shows to me that God has a message of well-being even to the pagan. If somebody had the impression God only wanted peace or well-being for those that uh, know him better or more than others, biblically that's not sustainable. Even Jesus says that God uh, gives sun and rain to both good and wicked. And uh, here Joseph brings to the Pharaoh an answer of peace, although Pharaoh does not seem to be a servant of uh, Yahweh or uh, a king of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace. God still has a message of peace. And I believe that this message of peace of the Pharaoh, or what God sent to the Pharaoh, was then unfolded by Joseph's presence there. There's even a moment that we'll see later is somewhat challenging to me because it seems to me that what Joseph does is uh, he makes the, the inhabitants of Egypt the slaves of Pharaoh. Have you noticed that? Later in the story, when the famine becomes uh, really, really bad, they get to the point where they sell their lands. Not only that, they sell themselves into slavery, so to speak. And you would think, how can the man of God even do that? Initially, the wisdom coming from God is about uh, five, uh, one fifth which is 20%. It's like an income tax that we should gather along the seven years and uh, pile up the food, create the reserve that we can access during the seven years of scarcity. You know that part of the story. But later it, it went much further. You would ask, was that still part of uh, divine plan and wisdom? We'll see you later. Yes, that's a very good observation. So, yeah, Joseph was an experienced dreamer that became a dream interpreter. It's amazing to see a prisoner brought out of prison, taken to the king to interpret some dreams, and he knows he doesn't have the interpretation. God has it. And he's confident, and he goes... And he tells the king, it's not me. It seems that on the way there, he already knows it's a message of peace. So somehow he has to be in communion or in conversation with God on that specifically. Otherwise, it would have been pretty risky to say it's a message of shalom. And then after you hear the dreams, 
you give uh, an interpretation like you gave to the baker. Would have been <laughs> pretty tricky, right? So, yeah, that's a good observation. But by the way, do you know of uh, anybody that uh, has the gift of uh, interpreting dreams? Do you even believe that God can speak to you via dreams? Okay. Have you had God speak to you via dreams? Uh -huh. You know, there's a... Let me see if I can get that verse. In the book of Ecclesiastes, I think, chapter 5... Verse 3 says, For a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. Does anybody have a different translation? I don't like this one for this verse. For a dream comes through much activity. A dream comes when there is many cares. From the multitude of cares do dreams come. That's what it says. And based on this passage, we, especially in the modern and postmodern society, we have kind of discarded every dream as if uh, every dream was a result of uh, too much uh, care. Or uh, if somebody is worried, then um, he or she would dream things, but those dreams have no significance. Or if you ate too much last night and uh, your stomach was heavy laden, then uh, you would dream, but those dreams have nothing to do with reality or no revelation from God. And that may be true when it comes to... Uh, eating too much at night. But what I'm trying to get to is with that, we kind of discarded every kind of communication coming from God through dreams because we don't want to be superstitious and we don't want to be mystical. I'm hearing that argument sometimes. So uh, does or can God communicate via dreams And uh, if yes, do you know of any people that have the gift of interpreting dreams? Today, yeah. if, if there are dreams, then there are no interpreters. I don't know. I'm just asking questions. Dreams that come from God, they come true. In all three cases here, the dreams that came from God, they came true. The first was very positive, came true. Second was very negative, still came true. The third, the double dream of the Pharaoh, that too came true, right? But the question is, who interprets the dreams? And um, I strongly believe, based on, on, on the passage here, that uh, if God did not stop communicating via dreams, then there might be people that can interpret dreams as well. They may be not very visible. We may not have an office at the church of a dream interpreter. But I'm just trying to open our understanding to a wider reality that God has no limitations today either of using His channels. There is, uh, in the book of Job, I think chapter 33, verse 15. So it's, it's there, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. In a dream, in a vision, so 33, verse 15. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds... Then he opens the ears of men. 
Yeah, verse 14 says, For God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. So I'm asking how many times God is speaking or has been speaking, and we somehow just missed it. So I want to encourage you to open your ears, eyes, hearts, because God still speaks. Most of the time when somebody has a dream, I don't know how that works really, it seems that people have dream, dreams for somebody else. What I see in the Bible is that God has dreams for that specific person. They dream about their own situation. So God may want to communicate something to me. He has other ways of communication, of course, but that's one of them. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the amazing story of Joseph. And we pray that you will continue to deepen our understanding so we can see more and we can discover some of the elements of uh, communication with you, from you, that we may have lost along the way. May your spirit guide us in Jesus' name. Amen.